Amazon CEO, Remzo W. Martinez. Go ahead and follow me on Instagram at Go Remzo. That's G-O-R-E-M-S-O. And as always, you've got the social media maven, Megan herself. Megan, you're you're a social media person. That's your whole thing. We're about to make you, you very we're about to make you feel very <laughs> uncomfortable today because today's topic is email marketing. What you need to know, why you need to know, what you need to know. You know? I, I, I do. I'll, I'll, I'll know. Know. Even yeah. though I know a lot of social media, I know a little bit of female marketing. So let let's let's go back in time because I think you and I both have interesting experiences getting into email. And and for for people who are just tuning in for the first time, you and I are similar in the fact that we got into marketing through social media marketing, social media management. A lot of what we do is figuring out how Facebook, X, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, everything you can possibly imagine works. And then email is just something else that we usually just got thrown at us because <laughs> somebody didn't want to do it. And this young person knows how the internet works. So obviously email <laughs> marketing should be easy. Pretty much. Yeah. I love the sum up of, oh yeah, this young person obviously knows how the internet works. That's how it always I feel like works. It's just like, I don't know, maybe it's like a millennial Gen Z, millennial thing. I feel like more so millennials, but people say I'm Gen Z. So I don't know. That's not discussion, but I feel like that is common for people. That depends on your view of whether or not you like avocado toast. Or are you asking me? Like uh, well, that will determine whether or not you're a millennial or Gen here. Z because you're, you're right at the cusp, right? I mean, I feel like there's a difference between liking it and like eating it all the time. Okay. Like if you saw avocado toast on a menu somewhere, would you be like oh, avocado toast? Or are you looking for like actual food? Looking more for actual food, especially at a restaurant. Like avocado toast if I'm at home is one thing, but that's like a rare luxury in a way. But like okay. at a restaurant, I'm like, no, I want then, something then more. At least, like then at least you, know? you lean millennial because Gen Z turned avocado toast into like the dumbest fad of the decade on top of a lot of things. They used to eat Tide Pods. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I never fell into the Tide Pod thing. I'm actually allergic to Tide detergent, just like on clothes in general. But I can't well, imagine what eating it would do to me. Okay, we're but already like, off track. When was the first <laughs> time you did anything with email? <laughs> so, sorry, what was your question? When was the first time you did any type of email marketing? When did that uh, yes. come on you? <laughs> yeah, it was my first job. Pretty much how you summed it up in terms of, oh, this is our new token young person who knows how the internet works. And I was tasked with sending out our daily newsletter every morning. I'd be the first to get in the office so I could send it out by like 9 a.m. Because they had email scheduling, obviously, but it would typically be like yesterday's content that we'd be sending out that morning. And they were very particular about wanting it out by 9 because it was kind of somewhat like b2b i guess where they were like oh we want it to be like when people are sitting down when they first get to their desks like at nine for them to be able to read it so it's kind of the logic there and, and um, you were at a non-profit but you were also like your your, your non-profit at the time had a publication so it was like a yeah, pseudo news yeah. and commentary outlet so basically you were telling everyone the news from the previous news cycle that they needed to know yes pretty much yeah and then we also did some like specialty campaigns that would be like petitions or just issues that, you know, we wanted to get to people and types of, um, I feel like we did a lot of list building as well, just like posting things on social, like, oh, subscribe to our newsletter and forward this to your friends or whatever. Um, a lot of, I feel like what I did in the first few months there was just modernizing the newsletter because it was very like outdated just the formatting and the way they built it was also very complicated it was like where to go in and like change the html code and like all this stuff to like really make it look right so it was just kind of complicated when it was like they have a newsletter builder in the email software we're using so why don't we just use that and do the drag and drop and make it easier <laughs> you know so. I, I i'm 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 a drag and drop person i can't really do much without drag <laughs> and drop i um uh -huh. I, I feel like, like you, email was one of those things that was just kind of shoved on me. I did not touch email for my first five years of being a marketer, having anything involved in that. I did not touch email. I touched direct mail 
direct mail as a copywriter before I even touched email. And, and wow. in my mind, email was email was for me to talk to my friends and family and occasionally get like a deal on a store or something. I felt like in the mid, you know, uh, two thousands that email was kind of like on its way out as an actual marketable tool, especially since everything just shows up in your spam anyway, which is an email marketer's nightmare. But email marketing for me, I genuinely felt like, you know, this is kind of dumb. Like who's actually reading this? Like every time you open it up, it's trying to sell you something. And that's a stigma that I have had to break for myself and break for my clients and uh, previous employers and stuff like that, because email can deliver value and can still ask for something without always feeling like there's going to be a giant alert button saying you need to buy this or donate here or else, you know, uh, Timmy's going to stay stuck in the well and last he's not going to find them. <laughs> so when I was at the Washington Times in 2019, uh, social media was still driving a majority of the traffic between Facebook and Twitter and Facebook still uh, like surpassed Twitter like three to one. It wasn't even a big thing. But what shocked me was that we had like a close to a uh, maybe I'm just exaggerating, but we had like a dozen different email lists for different things. Uh, you know, we had the daily news one. Then we had one that focused just on Washington, D.C. stuff and the national security. And then we had stuff for our editors like Cheryl Chumley's column and um, Charles Hertz column and all these different things. And they were segmented in a way where I was just like, is anyone, you know, clicking on these? And the truth was, is that people were, we gave them options. So you can get the generic one or you can get all these little ones. The idea was, is that we don't want to give you anything you don't want. And we want to give you exactly what you're looking for. And we had a dedicated email marketer whose job was just to work on those emails. And that, that was also, um, kind of a shocker for me because everywhere I had been previously in the nonprofit realm, previously in campaigns, like the manager, if I was on a political campaign, was writing the emails or fundraiser or somebody else. It always seemed like a secondary or tertiary task. It never seemed like anything important. And then I saw the numbers and I saw the amount of people that were actually clicking through the stories through email. And it was almost on par with what they were getting in organic search. It was, um, it was wild. So what it still taught me was like people want email and they're still willing to subscribe and open it up and click through to it to get to the website, which is what you as the marketer want. You want them to funnel through that. So, you know, it was, uh, it was a time where we were also pushing the paywall model and we were still asking for people to buy print subscriptions. But the value was always if you sign this, you're getting the exact stories you want. So that was the first time I really looked at email and I was like, okay, like this actually has a value. It's actually giving people something of value and it's not just constantly asking for something. Uh, then in 2020, I went over to the most difficult portion of my career and I went to work for a social media uh, a company called Parlor. That's where I first met Megan. And at this point, everyone is saying, huh? I was going to say, at least you got that out of it. At least I got that out of the so way. It's like the one good thing from Parlor. You, you are, I can genuinely say this, Megan, you are the best thing that came out of Parlor because after that, a whole lot of sh not so fun stuff happened. But what that taught me, what that taught me was that even a social media company needs an email list and what parlor did. And this is why so many companies have truthfully, honestly, they might not see it, but I'll, I'll tell you here, folks, the reason why parlor has gone through so many acquisitions is not because of the social media tool that it was, but because of the email list it maintained millions, millions of emails. It's a very expensive list with a high open rate and a very high uh, click through rate. So what I found was that when we were actually using our email to promote stories and to promote updates and everything, the email had value. I told our CEO at the time, we are only running off of venture capital. We are not making any direct revenue because we had not put in a, uh, an advertising model yet. And the advertising model we did put out was flawed. What we should do to immediately start driving money in so that way we actually have cash in the coffers is we should monetize the email list. And he was like, that's a horrible idea. Who would want to do that? And I was like, a lot of people offering us a lot of money. 
But that was another conversation. So I start seeing the numbers again and I'm like, oh my gosh, like there's a lot of value in this email and people are coming to me. I was the director of outreach saying that they want access to our email list. And I was like, here we have no cash. Here we have some cash. You take a pick. And they picked no cash. But <laughs> after that, I had become very close friends with a client named Ben Stein from The Mask, from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the Red Eye commercials, or if you're a 90s kid like me, you remember him as PC Pixie from Fairly Odd Parents. So <laughs> I had met him and he was freaking out. And I had already been out of parlor. I got laid off on my birthday. And um, well, I, I left. It was a it was a whole bunch of legalese. They say I left, I say I left, I say a lot of things. A lot of money went my way to leave. I may I make it very clear. Like they they spent a pretty penny to say, Remzo, how much to just bleh. and uh now that's no longer binding. But anyway, um, you know, Parler in January of 2021 is taken offline by Amazon, it's under attack by the media and everything. So, what do you have with all these celebrities and all these people that built massive followings almost overnight? Um, they start panicking. And for Ben Stein, he only had parlor as his only social media platform. He was never on social media prior. So he had like 30, 30,000 people his first week and then it eclipsed to like 80 K. He was one of the fastest and most engaged accounts on parlor. And I get a call from his, uh, you know, secretary and they're like, Remzo, we know you're out at parlor, but we need your help. We need to learn how to take Ben's audience and take it offline fast but we don't want to go to Facebook. And I was like, okay, <laughs> well, you could just promote your email list. And they're like, why? And I'm like, because that's the quickest way. And you own all the emails. And when you learn what social media platform you do want to be on, you could just redirect them there. And they're like, isn't email like from the dot com era? Does anyone still do that? And I was like, dude, you'd be amazed. So <laughs> they were like, Remzo, go ahead and jump on and make the email list. We'll pay you to do that. We'll pay you to take care of it for a little bit. And I was like, shoot, I know nothing about email. I had a Substack account, which I still have at remzo.substack.com. I still put out stuff uh, weekly on there. And I had moved a lot of people from my, my social account because I had like 20,000 followers on Parler. I moved a lot of those people over to my Substack, So I was like, well, Substack's a blogging platform. I've heard of MailChimp and Constant Contact and all this other stuff, but I've never really messed with it. So I said, well, how about we make Mr. Stein a Substack?" So within 12 hours of putting his um, Substack on Parler and telling people that he was going to be migrating them over because Amazon uh, AWS had told Parler that they had like 72 hours until they were gonna be taken off the servers. In 12 hours, Ben Stein got 18,000 emails. Jeez. It blew my mind. I got about 7,000 emails on mine. And at this point, I'm looking at this and I'm like, holy cow. Like, this is actually turning out. This is actually doing a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I went ahead and I managed uh, Ben Stein's email for about three years. And then... After that, I became mostly the email guy. When I went into the nonprofit realm, I was the guy who was uh, revamping their email, learning about segmentation, learning about the frequencies and how to do a better subject and preview line. And then I had to go back to you know, figuring out like good copywriting 101 and all this other stuff. And since then, it's like, you know, I feel as confident with my email marketing skills as much as I do my social media skills. And mm -hmm. I tell people this all the time. It's like, if you're going to do social media, you have to do email because if you don't think they'll ever take away your audience, I've got a case study for you. That's mm -hmm. on a giant Godzilla level. <laughs> yeah. I reminded me so much of at ALG too. It was like, as soon as Amazon was going to wipe parlor off the web, it was like, Every other post was like, subscribe to our mailing list. We don't want to lose contact with you. And I wish I remembered the numbers of how much we grew, but I remember we had like a giant surge as well. It was just like, I mean, for what it's yeah. worth, it definitely it was like it was like being the last man on the Titanic. You mm -hmm. wanted to get yeah. it. Really was. it was so chaotic and it was so depressing because I had grown our company's parlor account like so much. It was like my big success story. So it was just like, okay, well. At least we have the email. I honestly still use that type of verbiage sometimes of like, help stay in touch with you, like subscribe to our mailing list, like whenever we're doing like, you know, 
um, posts that are trying to encourage people to subscribe. So it still kind of works, but <laughs> definitely a more niche way of getting mailers. Well, that was like your Vietnam era. That was when you really <laughs> had to figure stuff out yeah. under one of like the most like, like, like the Simpsons could not have predicted what happened with that. Company. Honestly. Yeah. And it was my first job too. So it was just, it was a lot. Oh my God, really? <laughs> yeah. That was literally my first like career job with that whole thing. So it was just very, oh I mean, that's why I loved my first job because I felt like I was the email marketer. I was the social media manager. I was the graphic designer. I was the videographer. Like I was just like everything. So it's fun, but it was very overwhelming. But now I feel like since I've been doing social for like, like exclusively social for three years, that's why the email marketing is a little dusty in my brain. But I do remember right before I took that job and they're like, you're going to be in charge of our newsletter and sending it out every day. I took the like Hub, HubSpot email marketing certification <laughs> like that weekend before I started just so I had some idea of things. But then it was a lot of like getting them up to speed because they'd been doing emails kind of the same way. Like this is just our newsletter and we do it through this complicated HTML code and whatnot. And our list is kind of old and whatever. So it was a lot of revamping all of that, but it's kind of a distant memory at this point. Yeah. I, I feel like my career kind of goes in ebb and flow periods where I'm like majorly focusing on social media and then I kind of dips down and then I'm like really focusing on email. Uh, you know, for people that connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, you know, you, you see my marketer on the run uh, LinkedIn exclusive uh, newsletter, but I run several other uh, newsletters for myself. I do one with you know, my, uh, my Patreon for the second print comics club at second print, uh, comics.substack.com. And then I've got my original, uh, on the run newsletter, which is politics and culture at remzo.substack.com. See how, see how easy I am with the pitches and the plugs. Um, and, and, then for my, and then for my clients, like, you know, some of them require original copy because you're writing in a very clear voice. And then others are really just kind of like a gallery of featured stories and stuff. But what I really want to focus on today is like, why do, so, so basically folks, you know that Megan and I know what we're freaking talking about right now. Okay. Well, like we've been through the fires of figuring this out. We know what we're talking about. So why do, do you need to go ahead and focus on email marketing or just having an email list and keeping touch with people via email if you don't want to? Well, our friends over at Constant Contact, who should be paying us for this because, I'm about to say a lot of nice things about constant contacts. They've got an article that I'll go ahead and link to in the show notes today. What we're going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and read through it uh, kind of fast. And then Megan and I are going to go ahead and drop our thoughts in and hopefully you'll come out with some uh, good information on the other side. So this is by Ryan Pink, uh, Pinkham at uh, constant contact in their blog benefits of email marketing for small businesses with real examples. Thank you, Ryan. Deciding where to really invest, <laughs> deciding <laughs> where to invest your marketing dollars isn't a decision you take lightly as a small business owner. You know that you need to attract new customers and keep your existing clients coming back, but you can't afford to invest time or resources into something that isn't going to deliver the results you expect. That's why email marketing is important when it comes to small business marketing. Uh, in order to make a decision on whether or not it's right for your business, I'll pause right there. If you run a business that involves selling things to people, you need email. Now back to it's it. It's right for your business. Um, yeah, you need it. Like you need air to live. You need email. Okay. <laughs> um, it's important to know the benefits of email marketing. But before we get into the many benefits of email marketing, one of the top benefits that can affect your bottom line uh, and therefore needs to be mentioned right away. Email marketing has the highest ROI of all forms of marketing averaging about $36 in return for every $1 spent. Let's let's pause right there. Megan, I know you didn't read the article beforehand cuz I wanted you to give like your fresh raw opinion of this. When I when you see that number for every $36 spent on social media, you're you're spending the equivalent of a dollar on email. What, how does that what, what what pops in your mind? What are you thinking? Well, they always talk about the two for one special. What about the 36 for one special? It's yeah, unheard of. 36 for one. <laughs> 36 for, for $36 for every dollar spent. 
in case I in case I like got tongue tied a moment ago. That's a thirty six dollar return for every one dollar spent. When I first started figuring this out, I almost never wanted to put money on social media again. Yeah, especially with social because it's kind of like the I feel like the algorithms decide how well your app does as far as the cost per click. Yeah, thirty six per. Because it's not just. Like, I feel like at least for social, a lot of the ads that I do are like reach or engagement and so it's like oh it's like you're actually making money off email like i feel like for social it's all awareness for the most part like cost per click cost per thousand impressions where it's like with email you can actually see the results like it's very tangible exactly uh let's go ahead and continue but roi isn't the only reason why email marketing is worth your time and investment the importance of email marketing comes down to it being an effective solution that gives you the power to reach customers in a place most people visit every day their inbox uh data to back up the benefits of email marketing campaigns here are some of the top data-driven reasons to use email for your small business now mind you this was written about a year ago so just take that into consideration, but I have checked the numbers since, and they basically remain the same. 91% of us adults like to receive promotional emails from companies they do business with, according to marketing Sherpa email is almost 40 times more effective than Facebook and Twitter combined in helping your business acquire new customers. According to McKinsey, according to 80% of professionals, email marketing drives customer acquisition and retention e-marketer and then um, email marketing is more likely to drive sales than social media marketing. I can definitely say the last three points are the ones that nobody can dispute. Um, I have, I've like the ROI you get on social media in terms of like actual like purchasing products and stuff. You don't have the same relationship as somebody that has opted into your newsletter. You're getting discounts. You're getting updates on new releases. You're getting exclusive access to things. Uh, people have that relationship with email that they don't have with social. And I mean, when I really think about it, I've never, I, I've bought stuff on Facebook. I primarily, if I'm going to buy something from social media, I'm actually going to buy it from Instagram. I have bought more things from Instagram mm -hmm. ads than I've ever from Facebook, but I have never purchased or donated any dollar. I've never put any dollar through anything on Twitter. Yeah, I would agree with that. Instagram's always what gets me too. It's just like, but compared to like what I would spend on like, maybe not directly through the email, but if I get an email from like my favorite store about a sale, I'm going to go to that store and I'm going to spend all my money. You know, it's just kind of given. Yeah. It's just, I feel like it's just farther along in the sales funnel, like email marketing. Like you've got your social raise awareness. If they follow you, that's great. People follow hundreds of accounts. So like a follower versus a subscriber, like a subscriber is so much more meaningful than just a social media follower. Because a subscriber, they're saying, yes, I want your content. I want it straight to my inbox. I don't want to miss what you're seeing. Whereas it's like, if they follow you, you know, they just want to see your stuff occasionally, essentially, unless they turn on notifications for your account and they want to see everything you post. But I feel like that's extremely rare. So, and even then it's like still the subscriber base is just so much more meaningful. Yeah. But besides, I mean, I take it a step further. I, I've been saying this for years. I said this while I was at parlor, when you're on social media, you're basically social share cropping. You are building okay. up somebody else's value. You're, uh, somebody else is getting the primary value of your work, which is the audience, which is data. And they can take it away from you at any minute. They can make it as unfair mm -hmm. as possible and they don't have to give you notice. Whereas when you own mm -hmm. that email, you own that email relationship. No one can take that from you. Um, you yeah. know, if I want somebody to see my stuff right now, I can email them. If I want somebody to see my stuff right now on Facebook, I better be boosting some content. <laughs> like that's just no, exactly. Exactly. Is. That's just like what we talked about last week too, as far as social media algorithms. It's like, you really have to jump through hoops to reach your audience. Even like the people that followed you, you still have to like really go through it to even get your content in front of people who chose to see your content by following you. Whereas with email, you, you summed it up perfectly. Like you own that relationship. You can reach them whenever you want, however often you want. I mean, I guess we'll get more into best practices. You might not want to like spam them, of course, but you have so much more control over that relationship than you do on social. 
Exactly. So why is email marketing important? Email marketing is important for small businesses because it's a marketing workhorse. Not only does it help you keep in touch with those that want to hear from you, keeping you top of mind, which is the most important thing a marketer can provide to any sales team or to any development team. So that way everyone can keep getting paid, but it also allows you to educate your readers, drive traffic, conduct surveys, share updates, make announcements, etc. What I'm trying to say is that email marketing allows small businesses to do lots of different things all within one channel. And it still has the highest ROI, that 36 to one that we talked about earlier of any marketing strategy or channel. Honestly, the importance of small business email marketing really can't be overstated. If you're not yet convinced, just take one look at the following benefits of email marketing. So j just right there, it, it summarized everything that you just said, Megan. You said it perfectly. You're owning the relationship. You're keeping things all in one place. You can do so many different things with it. Uh, you know, surveys are are so understated. When I start doing um, an, uh, a lead generation campaign, I start building an email list for clients and stuff like that. The first thing I tell them is go ahead and get a survey going. And, you know, places like Constant Contact actually have a survey feature. So you don't have to just go to SurveyMonkey and um, do it that way. Like, you know, these email marketing, uh, these ESPs, these email service providers, such as Constant Contact, MailChimp's another one, uh, Active Campaign, like they're really good about giving you the tools that you need, HubSpot being one of the top ones. So before we jump into what make uh, what makes real small business owners say their top benefits of small of of uh, email marketing were, let's take a look at our top 10. One, create personalized content. Personalization is the number one benefit of email marketing because no one wants to read an email that sounds like it was just blasted out to a bunch of people. Email marketing allows you to segment your customers into different lists based off their preferences to send highly personalized content. From crafting the perfect subject lines to images that resonate with your customer and valuable content that helps your audience, email is the perfect channel to deliver those personal feeling messages. And, and you mentioned this when you were talking about um, ALG, Americans for Limited Government, when you were actually taking it and you're like, wait, like there's a lot we could be doing with this. Did you feel that the emails were, you know, actually like nice to see, nice to read? Did they have that personal touch? Or was that something that as you kind of messed with it, you were like, you know, it's got to actually sound like it's coming from somebody on the other end. Like somebody's putting this together. It's not just like manifesting straight from the ether or anything. Right. I think that's definitely something that we developed over time. Uh, as far as the look, like just doing the rebranding and having it, giving it that more modern feel, as opposed to how it was before, which had like a very sort of outdated, like early 2000s type of graphics, like early dot com sort of era type of esque visuals. So just increasing like the graphics that we had and the images and the quality and including videos and you know, different types of media in itself helped. Personalization also helped. We didn't do that as much with our newsletter. I think we started because that was just kind of a general newsletter for like our publication. So it wasn't as personalized, but we did start doing sort of a little blurb at the top. That was a little bit more organic, I guess, natural, conversational, I think is the right word. And then for our petitions, we did more of like personalization, making it like the person was getting a letter from our organization president. So that had a lot more of the personal touch. But I wish we'd done more with it. Because so I feel like there's all what's the thing that's nice about email marketing is I feel like there's just always more to do. There's so much opportunity to personalize more, to find out more information about your subscribers and like so many opportunities to just cultivate relationships with your most loyal base, like your subscribers. So yeah, for, for Ben Stein, one of the things I had to figure out was like, what do we ultimately want to get out of this email? It's like, what are we driving him to? And uh, you know, he was on YouTube for a while and then YouTube didn't like him. So then he went to rumble because YouTube, you know, basically like put him in YouTube jail. So then mm -hmm. what we did was, you know, we were promoting every episode of the show through the Substack account. Uh, you know, when we had to do the pivot from YouTube to rumble, that was a pretty big thing. And mm -hmm. I can't say that his, um, well, I mean, he, 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 he has said this out loud as co-host, uh, Judah on the, on the show as well have also said this the rumble channel could not have survived had it been for the substack email list if we did not redirect people who are watching it on youtube and tell them you have to go to rumble 
um, that rumble channel, that, uh, that rumble channel, that rumble, uh, channel would not have been able to exceed YouTube and it wouldn't have been able to keep him engaged. It's one of those things where you can pivot people. It's really hard to promote one social media platform on another social media platform. The return mm-hmm. that you're going to get from that is very difficult, but when you can pivot with email, that's a big deal. And what I also had to figure out was, um, you know, the different email types, you were sending two to three emails per week. So they couldn't all just be promotional. One of them that we did for a while was one was like, you know, Ben's top stories and Ben would go ahead and we would have a bunch of stories that were uh, relevant and were mattered to the audience. So we became kind of a news focused uh, aggregator type of uh, newsletter. So you got that like on Wednesdays. And then, you know, Ben would actually write it in the form of a blog, kind of like, you know, the spectator articles and stuff. So one was like an exclusive Substack piece of content. So people got conditioned to opening it up because what we found was that they never really knew what they were getting. Eventually, they began to know that they're getting a lot of variety, which is what made them stay and made it grow. But, um, you know, tailoring it towards the audience and giving them something a little bit different throughout the week. So we were providing as much value as much as we were asking value from them. Um, that helped him really like thrive. And when he moved from different uh, platform to another, when he had a story or a big award or something like that, the Substack was primarily it. I feel like you summed up what like the best parts of marketing are, which is providing value to your customers and so i feel like with email like you described there's just so many opportunities to do that as opposed to social or even direct mail it's like i feel like that can be you know more unreliable than email like email you know they can move addresses however many times they want chances are they're not going to switch email addresses so yeah so point three increase brand recognition do people recognize your brand With email marketing, you can easily brand your emails, but brand recognition goes beyond design. By constantly providing valuable content to your audience, like what we just talked about, (laughs) uh, they will begin to recognize and even anticipate your emails. Are customers happy with the content you're providing? Would they like to learn something different? You can even create brand, uh, brand identity survey to get useful feedback on your brand. Using a survey or, or start a discussion, use a survey or start a discussion on social media. Once you get them involved in the process, you'll know exactly how to provide valuable content in your emails. Uh, point four. I mean, we, we had talked a lot about that. So point four, improve sales. This is the thing that really matters because your development people, or your salespeople, this is where they're going to bug you the most and have the most input um, as they should. I think for email, they, you know, this is where they, you really need to rely on them. Uh, 60% of consumers say they've made a purchase as a result of a marketing email they've received. I'm part of that 60%. You send me a discount for something I've bought before and you're getting my money. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm a trained dog when it comes to that. Promoting your business through email marketing gives your audience the chance to make a purchase right there from their phone or laptop. Uh, small business email marketing can be used to sell prospects, boost referrals, upsell to current customers, and even re-engage customers that have not purchased from you in a while. The more relevant and targeted your email content is, the more likely that readers will take action. Quick question, Megan. Have you noticed that your interaction with email offers in general has increased or or decreased since the lockdowns of 2020? Um... I don't know if I'm really the best person to ask this to because I was, you know, in college before the lockdown. So I feel like I checked email a lot for school, but not a lot on a personal note. But I do feel like as I've gotten older over the years, I check email more than I used to. And not so much like to stay connected or anything, but to look for sales, look for deals, especially with the economy right now to try to save money. It's like if, you know, let's say I need to buy a special like dread or something for what I'm going to. It's like, I want to check my email, see when, like, oh, is the store having a sale or not? No. So I'll check back next. You can see, you know, things like that. Yeah. Uh, studies have shown that as people get older, they're actually going to spend less time on social throughout the day. And they're going to place a more of an emphasis on the immediate value, which is email. So they're going to realize you get mm-hmm. Now what we're seeing is that email becomes more important to you. 
Uh, secondly, mm -hmm. since 2020, because of all the algorithm changes, because of the pay to play system that social media really has become now, uh, email is that even ground. Are there changes in the email industry? Yeah, there's a reason why we're seeing a rise in text messages. My phone is blowing up all day right now and will through November of this year because I seem to have been on like every politician's uh, list rental service and they're spamming me about how the country is going to burn down and stuff and it's miserable. <laughs> You're already starting to see those changes. But uh, email marketers have had a boom for, for almost a decade, from like 2010 to 2020. Everyone was like, email's out, social media is in. And then the lockdowns happen, and everyone's like, hire all the email marketers you can, grow that list. And uh, that, that became the thing that they could rely on and still do rely on for a lot of things, like you said. Um, so point five, build stronger customer relationships. Email marketing can help build customer relationships by providing them with information they want directly in their inbox on a consistent basis. Uh, when you make your audience's lives better, whether that be with your product or service, helpful tips, or even just a happy birthday gift coupon, you send me that, I'm totally going to spend something. Mm -hmm. um, they will learn to appreciate and trust you. Eventually, they will begin to look at, uh, to look to your business for information and value um, because of the value you've been providing them, thinking of you first when they need your services. I think that's a great point too, because I don't feel like I'm really benefiting anything from social media, regardless of platform. Whereas with email, it's like you, you're risking me not opening it. And if I don't open it enough times, it's going to go to another folder. And then eventually mm -hmm. your bounce rate's going to go up. And even though you're sending stuff to me, you know, Gmail or, you know, uh, Microsoft, whatever, whatever you've got, they're basically going to be like, we'll take care of this and dump it out for you. So you don't have to do it yourself to clear up your inbox for other things. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like email is really the only thing that feels even more relational than social media. Social media is social. I still tell that to people. But mm -hmm. if you want a one-to-one -one relationship, um, email, I feel, and the studies have constantly shown this, this is where you really develop that long-term you know, relationship with your customers and audience. Mm -hmm, definitely. I think one trend that we've been seeing, especially since COVID and like the rise of TikTok for social is that it's mm -hmm. becoming, sorry, I keep kicking the chair across me. Um, Where are my new neighbors stomping on the ceiling? It happens. It's apartment living. Hey, folks, we love it. We, we live amongst the people. We live normal <laughs> lives. Um. What was I saying? Yeah, so social media has become a lot more like entertainment based with the rise of TikTok, the short form video content, everyone's attention span, they're just in the toilet. And so I feel like social media is becoming less of a social network and more of like an entertainment sort of network. Like instead of watching TV, you just mindlessly scroll and get entertained. And you know, that's all fine and dandy. But if you're a business trying to like actually make sales, it's all the more reason to focus on email marketing because you're able to reach people directly with your product. They've already opted in to wanting to receive your content. So it's just kind of a win-win. Yeah, absolutely. Now I'm going to go ahead and just glide by these next points because they basically speak for themselves. Folks, if you want to read this whole article, you can go ahead and just check the link in the show notes later. But six, optimize your time and budget. We've already talked about that 36 to one return that a lot of businesses are seeing when they implement an email marketing strategy. Point seven, increase your traffic to your website. Don't just hope they'll Google you or search you in the search <laughs> bar or something. Brag about yourself. Let them know about your stuff. Increase traffic to your website is a great benefit. Establish authority, as they've kind of mentioned earlier. Build excitement. I like this part. Everyone likes to belong to a special group especially when they can receive exclusive perks. Your customers aren't all the same and the one size fits all approach doesn't work. Use your email campaigns to drive home the message that your customers are unique and important to your business. Whether you're giving a section of customers a sneak peek into an upcoming product launch or simply rewarding them for being loyal customers, they all love a sweet deal. Volkswagen offers email subscribers free movie tickets several times a year. I did not know that. <laughs> I'm not a Volkswagen owner, but suddenly I want to figure out how they get in on that if you just subscribe to their email list. Um, Starbucks gives their gold members free drinks around the holidays. That is true. As a small business, you might not be able to go around giving away free stuff to your customers all the time, but a little something extra can go a long way. Rewarding your customers is a nice gesture. And from your side, it's a great way to accelerate your marketing goals. Everybody wins. 
I'm so glad that they talk about this. It's this, it's not necessarily a FOMO factor, but you're making someone feel like they're part of something uh, exclusive. Like they are special Mm -hmm. in some way. I have had people who have, um, you know, who I've worked with where we've had their email newsletter list referred to as a club, a membership. And we do provide them with free things and gift and uh, discounts and sneak peeks and, you know, announcements to them before it goes public, because you, you want to cultivate that in a way that you can only do that with email. You can't really do that with anything else. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And then number 10, email is an asset you own as if we haven't covered this enough. Although this benefit is listed as number 10, it doesn't mean it's the least important benefit. On the contrary, as a business owner or marketer, this is probably the most important benefit of email marketing to know. Think about it. With social media, the platform owns everything you do on it. Every post, every connection, everything. But with email marketing, your email list and all your campaigns, sent or not, are assets that you own. This means that no one can take them from you. Amazon, cough, cough, or (laughs) keep you from reaching out to your customers, no matter what provider you use or when. The only caveat is, of course, that your email content is legal and abides by the terms and conditions of that provider. And that's another thing I also want to mention. Uh, I I worked for a nonprofit that was just begging and paying in some cases for people's email lists. And then they wonder why their unsubscribe rate was so high and why they were getting reported for spam and why their bounce rate was so high from inactive emails. There are, and this could be a whole other episode, but you know, it's like something you've got to feed and something you got to, you know, treat healthy. If you just give, you know, if you just give someone nothing but sugar, they're going to go on a diet. They're going to get, they're going to get the diabetes. Okay. Like you can't, just, <laughs> um, you, you, and you can't just, you know, I, I equate it to like, you can't just like break into somebody's house and start changing the channel with the remote when they're watching TV. One, because that's creepy. Two, because that's illegal. That's <laughs> that's kind of like how people feel with email. They're like, how did they get this information? They feel, they feel like their personal space has been invaded. And what I tell mm-hmm. people is, you know, there are so many ways to get an email list going that you know, buying it from somebody else or just you know, taking it from somebody else, saying, hey, I know you have an email list. Can I have your emails? One, that's not going to help you in the long run. That's going to harm you. Two, there's ethics, ethical problems with that. Three, we're, we're entering now as a phase where there may be legal problems, whitelisting mm-hmm. your email, sta- stating where you obtained emails, how you obtain them. Uh, there, mm-hmm. Like this year, the, the number of new regulations from Google and Hotmail that have gone into uh, how you can acquire and how you can contact people is changing things. But uh, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, if you don't, own your contact info, you don't own anything. And that can be taken from you any day of the week. And they've got more reviews and testimonials from business owners and marketers in this article. In this article, I highly recommend you folks go ahead and read this afterwards, whether you're a marketer who wants to kind of expand their skills beyond just what you're doing into email marketing, or um, you're a business owner and you just haven't had a practice before. So Overall thoughts on this, Megan, have I, have I gotten you so excited that you're going to go ahead and start implementing so many new ideas at work tomorrow? You're going to be like, stop what we're (laughs) doing. We need to try this with email. See, you're actually making me very nostalgic because yeah, email is actually in a different department where I work, which is an interesting sort of structure, but I do sometimes miss email marketing. And I feel like all the things that we talked about, it's like, I don't know. I feel like it's like you said, every social person should know marketing. And I do know some, but I'm so out of practice, but I definitely miss it. And and happy I've been able to help you with your email marketing for Marketer on the Run because Absolutely. it's definitely a fun thing to do. I do want to echo your point about not buying lists because that is the thing that they're an issue that I dealt with at previous jobs. And yeah, it really does just create more problems than it solves. and make the, It's like putting like a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. It just does nothing and really makes it worse. It makes it affected somehow. I don't know how that would have bad it for, but <laughs> my, uh, my, my worst situation was for this nonprofit. I went to go work at after parlor where they had obtained so many free, what they did was they would collaborate with other like-minded groups and stuff like that. And they would say, give me your email list. Well, they wouldn't say it like that. They'd be more polite, but it was basically like, give me your email list. 
So mm-hmm. here you have a bunch of people that are suddenly getting emails that one they did not sh- they did not consent to. The mm-hmm. big word consent. They did not consent to it. Two, mm-hmm. um, from the from the nonprofit angle, you don't know these people. You don't mm-hmm. know if they even care about what you do. So what mm-hmm. what what's ha- what happens if one you break into somebody's house and then you start moving furniture around? You're gonna tick them off. Uh, so you know they uh, the the constant contact article talked a lot about building authority and brand recognition. It can build that negatively. And what we that mm-hmm. what we had to deal with was the fact that we had actually ticked off a lot of people because one mm-hmm. it's like we're one we're in their their space two you know we're 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 taking stances or views that they don't like and what mm-hmm. we had to do is we had to stop that practice uh, mm-hmm. because you know their open rate was abysmal their click through rate was horrible that and they were sending at one point. Um, well, my fir- during my first month, I think there was a week where we sent 12 emails in one week. Gee, that's too and many. When I went at first, what I did was I moved us from MailChimp to Constant Contact. Then what I did was I purged it of all the emails that were basically like dead emails that were never opening our stuff. So I just got rid of them. So that actually took a chunk out and they freaked out about that. I'm like, no, this is good. You know, it's, it's <laughs> It's like, do you want, if you're going to, if you're a surgeon and you take out cancer and you're going for a tumor, do you leave a little bit of the tumor in there or do you take it all out? You want to take all of it out, right? So we had Mm -hmm. to do that because we need the list health numbers to actually start showing what is really reflective of the numbers that we have. Then what we did Mm -hmm. was we segmented it based off interest, based off frequency of opens, uh, then what we did after that was we provided more opportunities for people to choose how often they got emails. Do you just want press releases? Do you want every email? We started doing a weekly recap email, which was a big thing for me. I was the editor for that. I put that together and that was really just a recap of everything from the week. And it was more engaged. We put in graphics and videos and surveys and stuff like that. So it was really more engaging. And, um, you know, even on our website, we were like, Hey, like, you know, sign up for our email list, but you can choose, like, do you want like once weekly or twice, you know, like once a week or twice weekly, I made it. So that way it's like, we have to cap the number of emails we put out or else we will be considered spam and people won't like us. And these email providers won't like us either. (laughs) And, um, you know, it went from like 12% open to 25% open. We went from like 1% click through to 10% click through for people who don't know email numbers. Those are really good numbers. Mm-hmm. We went from like like the worst industry standard to the best industry standard. People started coming to us and asking me how to help them with their lists and stuff like that. But it came through understanding the relationships we've had with the people in there, understanding the content they want, giving them options, and then just treating it sanely. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's really the most you can do sometimes. Mm-hmm. I feel like you could do an email marketing one-on-one class very easily. Like I feel like I've, this has been like a refresher and a fresh course at the same time. Well, folks, the first thing you can do is subscribe on LinkedIn to the marketer on the run newsletter there. Why do we do that on LinkedIn? To grow awareness. We did that for LinkedIn specifically as an experiment because when you set up a LinkedIn newsletter, um, it, uh, alert goes out to your entire network. I had a bunch of connections. So I was like, let's hit everybody I'm connected to. Then what it does is it sends an email. So it sends a newsletter email to that LinkedIn, uh, members email that's tied to their account, but they also get a notification if they're in the app and we're up to about 178, um, emails, uh, I'm sorry, uh, subscribers from LinkedIn in just a couple of months. Uh, Megan is really driving a lot of the content on there and I'm jumping in, making sure that, you know, my, my face is still on it and it's good to go, (laughs) but that's been fun. Uh, you know, and when you do that, that allows me to focus on other projects because like I said, I run other email lists for myself. I also run email lists for my clients. So that's another thing too, folks, whether you don't want to do it or whether you don't have time to do it, get somebody who knows what they're doing and do it. And the first thing you could do today is go to marketerontherun.com, go down below, hit the hit the message area thing and uh, you know send me an email and let's get a call on the calendar today and let me help you with your email marketing. So Megan, send thank an you very email much. To, send an email. 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 <laughs> 
should be uh, your slogan. Oh, yeah. Send an email to talk about email. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. That's a wrap. Uh, take care. Keep running. And good night. Run faster. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get this. Forget about it to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.